uh, Jim Clifford from uh, Qualcomm. He's a senior vice president. He's going to give us a talk today on the mobile wireless phenomenon, a continued need for advanced lithography. Jim? Super. Well, good morning. I'm really impressed to see this many people up early in the morning to hear a person like me talk about the mobile wireless phenomenon. So I'll, I'll try and translate it into terms that will be more meaningful to you. And I think those will run along the lines of, if you build it, will they come? And I think that's an important question. So I'm going to try and convince you in the next half an hour or so that if you build it, we will come. And we really do need you to build it. So we're on the verge of a couple of things. There would be maybe three elements in the talk this morning. One is that there is a huge opportunity for both of us going forward. And that that opportunity is created by an insatiable demand, mostly by your kids. So please keep on having them, or grandkids at the very least. So I think the, the insatiable demand create, and the opportunity that creates will cause us to collaborate together. So I think collaboration is the third thing which will be buried inside. So this slide, I spent a lot of time with marketing guys saying, I need something that is subliminal, but overt. So this is my subliminal overt slide. And it says, no matter what else you hear today, cost is really, really important. And I think the way to get to it is if you look at Moore's Law as an economic statement that says, at every node, transistors will cost half as much as they did at the last node. That's a really, really important thing. Because if for whatever reason they don't, then I think we have some big problems in front of us. So enough of my subliminal overt slide. So I wanted to have a social media quiz with you today. And I thought, let me ask you, there will be 38 icons that are going to appear up there. And the big question is this, how many of them do you recognize? So first of all, how many people recognize all 38? Know them, love them, have them on your cell phone today? Hmm, not too many people. How many people have perhaps more than half of them that you know, love, and use? Ah, I have a friend, thank you very much. So, and there are probably people that have any number all the way down to, well, how many people have at least one? Well, this is good. This is good. You're alive. You're awake. It's an interactive dialogue. This is a good thing. So I thought, you know, I used to do it with things that I didn't use. And I thought, well, let me just take the opportunity to, to say there are things out there that I use, you know, which could be social media, could be health, the ability to monitor your heart rate on your cell phone if you have heart issues, which lots of us have. You can read a book. Uh, there's just lots of things that you can do. Down at the bottom, there's one called Skifta, S-K-I-F-T-A. So other than the fact that Qualcomm owns that piece of software, it is not a commercial. Do not run out and buy Skifta because I said so. It happens to be free, but that's not really relevant. What in the world would Skifta do for you? So if you had Skifta on your cell phone, your smartphone, when you went home, if you fired up that app, it would sniff your wireless LAN. It would look for sources of things. So it might find my PC, my wife's PC, an iPhone, an iPad, a Samsung Galaxy tablet, whatever. Anything that's on the wireless LAN that identifies itself as a source of data will show up on Skifta. Skifta will then show you destinations in your house. It might be your TV. It might be a picture frame. It might be whatever. It could be those same devices that are sources. Once it's found the sources and the destinations, it will ask you, what would you like to move between those two? Could be a song, could be a picture, could be a movie. And then it makes that connection for you and wirelessly transports some piece of content from a source to a destination. I think that's pretty cool. So a lot of us have seen an, an opportunity for what's called the connected home. 
And I think Skifta is an indication of what's coming not too far down the road. This ability to move things, content, seamlessly from one place to another in your house, in your office, in your life. So I thought that was an interesting thing. There are lots of other interesting things in there. The uh, marketing people made me put games in the bottom right hand corner. I am not a game person. My grandchildren are. So I stuck those down at the bottom. So I think, I think I found that kind of an interesting slide, my life on a smartphone. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk to you about something that really sounds big, the biggest platform in the history of mankind. Wow, that's a really pretty bold statement. So what do I mean by that? If I go back and look backwards in time, in the 60s and 70s, there were roughly a million mainframe computers. They were replaced by about 10 million mini computers, which were replaced by about 100 million PCs. And today, when you look at things today, there are over a million uses. I'm sorry, not a million, but a billion. And this year, or within the next few years, we will pass 10 billion uses of wireless devices. So you say, well, what does that mean? There are 6 billion handsets in the world today. There are 6 billion people in the world today, too. Lots of people have more than one wireless device to communicate on. I don't know about you, but I have a cell phone, which I carry. I also have a tablet, which I try to use to displace my PC, which I can't really quite get rid of because it's a laptop, but it still won't go away. So I end up being three of those 10 billion things. But over the next few years, we're adding things at the rate of a billion things a year to this wireless connectivity uh, network, if you will. So that's a pretty big number, the biggest platform in the history of mankind. So here's a good question for you. If these smartphones are so good, what is it that makes a smartphone smart? And I think lots of people have lots of opinions. I mean, first of all, to me, it has to be always on. It has to be always connected. It has to be situation aware. I'll talk about that for a second. And it has to be power efficient. So what exactly is situation aware? Now, you could say, well, my cell phone has GPS and it knows my x, y, and z coordinates, and maybe it knows my velocity, but it knows a lot more than that. It knows if you're in a meeting, because it's connected to Outlook, and it knows your status. It knows, for instance, if you're in church, and don't want your cell phone to ring. But even better than that, some people have found a clever use for it. If you're walking down the street in San Jose, and you're within proximity of a Barnes & Noble, if there's still a Borders around, or some other bookstore, your smartphone also knows where you are and where that store is. And it knows that you buy books. And it knows what books you buy. So it could say your favorite author has a new book that you don't have. And by the way, there's a Barnes & Noble store 100 feet ahead of you on the right that has a Starbucks inside. And oh, by the way, here's a coupon to buy a book which is valid for the next 30 minutes. That's an interesting concept. So I think smartphones and smart wireless mobile devices, I think, are becoming very, very important to, to our life. And you notice the differentiation between mobile and fixed. Very, very subtle. Your fixed device could do the same thing, but you don't generally carry a fixed device because it's fixed. So I think it has to be mobile, and it has to be smart, and it becomes very, very helpful and, and, and deeply embedded in our way of life. So let me broaden the network just a little bit and say, OK, now that's a smartphone, but what about a smart connected device? And I kind of gave you a scenario in the home with Skifta, but you can look from left to right. There are dongles. There are wireless hotspots, concentrators that can take a bunch of wireless LAN things and convert them into a, a CDMA or WCDMA wireless WAN device. There are smart power meters that can turn your refrigerator on and off or your air conditioner or whatever else they need to do. But the action to me is over on the right-hand side. The left-hand side is part of connectivity. But next to the smartphone, there's this interesting thing called a tablet. And next to the tablet, there's a thing like a laptop. And next to that, there's a thing like a television set. And for years, we've talked about the convergence of the three screens. Who's going to win the battle? Look inside the television. Today, wireless LAN, 3D, almost an internet device, pretty interesting. Television guys are not going to lay down and go away. Tablet. Tablet's trying to find a niche for itself. How does it carve out that space in between? It is mobile. It is connected. It could be always on. 
it's pretty close. So I think there's, there's a, uh, uh, not a battle, but there's some differentiation to take place over on the right-hand side as we try and sort that out. But smart connected devices clearly are going to offer us some opportunities going forward. So we think mobile is at the center of the ecosystem. That's an important thing. This is almost a commercial. Uh, I took off the commercial part at the bottom because it would have had Qualcomm and it would have had a Theros. But probably most of you know that last year we acquired a $3 billion company called the Theros. And, and it really was to add the missing pieces for us and to add the missing pieces for them. So you have mobile, you have computing, you have the internet of everything. Wow, stop for a second. What else is there besides the internet of everything? So what might be things on the internet of everything? A while back, Samsung put out a, a refrigerator that had the equivalent of a tablet mounted on the front door. And the deal was, as you put food in, you barcode scanned it in, and as you took things out, you barcode and scanned it out. So for instance, one day you might put in a container of milk. Two weeks later, you might think you had a container of milk, but your fr refrigerator knew better. So if you decided you wanted milk, it would say, uh-uh, don't have it. Uh, one of those applications uh, that I showed you in the beginning was called out of milk. So you might get a note on your application out of milk that you need to go to the store because your milk is now something other than milk. So I think you're going to see a move toward these uh, internet of everything devices. A couple of examples would be simple things like your uh, washing machine and your dryer, um, the refrigerator I already gave you, smart picture frames, smart speakers where you could gesture and send a song from your personal device on you to a device which is wirelessly connected to a network. So we see this, that plus consumer electronics. And the last one I left on because it's important, I am a wireless bigot. I believe wireless is the center of the universe. But my friends on the wired side of the world gave me a rude wake up call. And that call was, every wireless thing ends in a wire. And don't forget how important those wires really are because nothing works without them. So now you have things like Ethernet, PON, which is passive optical networks, the fiber that's outside your house, Ethernet switches and routers. And we think that it's important to, when you optimize things, optimize the complete ecosystem. So don't just make a wireless thing really smart, but you really have to figure about what backhaul is and how to get things back into to, to the internet and connected that way. So this whole ecosystem itself is interconnected and solutions have to deal with the complexity of that ecosystem. Oops, I was supposed to tell you there's a movie coming. Here are a few examples of Snapdragon advanced software technologies. Snapdragon enabled browser optimizations to deliver the real web, just like on a desktop. Videos in multiple formats can be viewed in full 1080 high definition straight from your browser. We're also enabling direct peer-to-peer -peer connections that enable people to share content, communicate, or play without having to go through the cellular network. The AllJoin proximity-based peer-to-peer software framework helps overcome the complexities of connecting via short-range radio protocols such as Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. This enables developers and device makers to quickly and easily roll out new proximity-based applications. Snapdragon software technologies also convert existing 2D video to 3D with the touch of a button, adding a new dimension to digital entertainment. Other Qualcomm technology helps wirelessly connect mobile devices to TVs with Wi-Fi display, so people can easily play games, browse photos, even watch high-definition video on a big screen. We're also partnering with innovators in multiple industries. Working with SRS Labs, for example, we're helping to improve the sound of digital content, turning something that sounds like this into this. This enables OEMs to provide a home theater experience with digital surround sound and HD video. We're even pioneering new ways to interact with your device using gesture controls for phones and tablets. And photographers can better capture the moment with zero shutter lag, multi-burst capture, and face detection capabilities. These are just some of the many ways Snapdragon Advanced Software Technology is improving the mobile experience.
I think that was pretty impressive. I can't, I guess I, guess I would uh, ask you how the sound was for that. Was the sound good, bad, or not so good? I, if it was good, it was good. If you had Dolby surround sound, the difference between this and that is really, really quite impressive. So, but you know, we, you do what you do. I think cover up the word Snapdragon because it's not meant to be a commercial for Qualcomm stuff, but it's an opportunity of things to come in the future or in the near present. And I think that's really, really important. There are so many companies like us that are bringing these kinds of things forward to you, but again, embedded in there is this march of technologies from 65 to 45 to 28 to 20 to 14, thin fets, blah, blah, blah. It's very, very important. The connection here is all these things are there, but it's really important that you guys do what you do, which is continue to bring that technology forward from a lithography standpoint. Okay, so now I'll a verge a, spl a split again. There are many ways to solve these problems. We, Qualcomm, have chosen an integrated approach, which means that we're going to put everything in one place. So my eyes are tired and I can't see all the things in front of me, but actually let me try and read it off a slide so that I don't do an injustice to it. There it is. So what are some of these processor intensive applications? Surround sound you heard, gestures you saw, uh, multiburst capture and face select. That's an interesting opportunity for us. If you look at how many megapixels there are in a picture, they're on the order of eight megapixels in a picture. And in those eight me megapixels, we need to sort through and find faces. So facial detect has been done. It can identify your face. You can then tag all of your photos and find every picture that you've ever been in, which is also kind of a scary thought if you connect it to YouTube and some places maybe you didn't want people to know that you've been. But you know, facial recognition is a big part of it. But buried underneath there is a subtlety, and I think you saw it in the video, smile detection. Did you notice how carefully they identified the smile on that person and then there was a small knob underneath that could change that smile into a frown. So what does that mean? That means that any picture that you take may no longer be a real representation of what actually happened. Kind of a scary thought. But smile detection is good because now we can look at people and say, hey, your smile on a scale of 100 was an 83, and you could go home and work on that and see if you could perfect it a little bit more. So facial detection I talked about, 2D to 3D is kind of a cute thing. We now have the ability to analyze every pixel in a picture and convert a picture which was taken into 2D into 3D. That's a pretty cool thing. A noise cancellation you heard, the 3D camera, 3D display, and HD and video games. So lots of, lots of uh, video, very intensive processor applications. So for us, we have chosen to integrate all of the things that you need to, to build this ecosystem into one chip. And so the complexity of that really is we need to be number one or number two in a bunch of things. So at the heart of it all is the CPU, and we talked about some of those calculations, but the GPU is right next door, and the DSP is not far away, and you also need to have RF and connectivity and everything else that's on that slide. So the tricky part is how do you become number one or number two in all of these things? Because I think they're all important. So an example of why would you focus on CPU architecture? Over the last five generations of Snapdragon, we've increased the processor performance measured in DMIPS by a factor of eight. That's pretty impressive, maybe not mind-boggling, but the reason, again, is the demand, the pervasive demand is out there, and it seems that no matter how many MIPS we put into a device, somebody needs twice as many. And the subtlety is there's a power curve that runs right underneath that, which says the power can't go up very much more. I'll give you a subtle example. This is a hand. I have two of them. I'm not allowed to have a cell phone because it interferes with the audio system here. But if I had a cell phone, that cell phone in my hand is capable of four watts. Why? Because if it does any more than four watts, it gets hot and my hand drops it. Not a good thing. So there is a physical limit to the power that you can put in here. But there is no physical limit to the amount of DMIPS that people want in here. So that's just for the CPU. Get, got the same problem for the GPU. And a lot of us are spending a lot of time trying to deal with 
rendering and, and shaders and all kinds of cool things. So the, the drive on GPU performance and CPU performance, just as examples of all the rest of those things in that big circle, is huge. This is what drives 28 nanometers to high K metal gate to thin FETs at 14 and all those exciting things. So now the tricky part is we put it all together into one thing and it dissipates power. So notice I have a power meter on the left hand side that shows as things go by they dissipate various amounts of power. So for me, since I couldn't actually watch that as fast as I wanted to, I'm going to repeat it one more time for you. So first we'll be in standby, and then we'll go to messaging, and then we'll make a call, then we'll try to find our way, surf the web, watch and stream videos, and God forbid, play games. And the power meter, you know, if it were in the right colors, would be a thermometer with the top bulging at the seams, trying to deal with all that stuff. And again, who wants all that stuff? It's probably not us, because most people in here may or may not have 38 applications on their phones. But your kids do, and your kids' kids do. I now have a grandson that can figure out how to, and, and the little guy's like two and change. I mean, he's not a big guy. But he can figure out how to turn my phone on, and how to find the app he wants, and play it, and entertain himself at two and a half. This is scary stuff. So what enables smartphones? I will learn a lesson from this. Either I get new glasses or I figure out how to see. So I, I think I mentioned you need best-in-class hardware. And across the top is a list of best-in-class hardware, CPUs, GPUs, all those things. We have to be number one or number two in every one of those things. And that's really, really, really hard. But it's not just about the hardware. It's also the software. And you saw lots of apps that dealt with entertainment, connectivity, camera, blah, blah, blah. But then there's another tricky one, which is operating systems. You probably have noticed that no one operating system has subsumed everybody else's. So Android seems to be doing pretty good. But the Apple folks with iOS, they seem to be doing pretty good. There's a Samsung thing called Bada. There's the RIM people that make BlackBerry. There's Windows. There's, Windows. There's uh, Chrome, which has its own symbol, and Windows Phone. So one might wonder, why is it that one operating system does not subsume all the others? I don't know the answer, but I'll speculate. Apple things seem to have to do with content delivery. I noticed that an iPod is a pretty cool thing, but it's different from an MP3 player. Why? Because if you want a tune, you get a tune. How you get a tune, you don't know. I mean, you just buy a song. It comes over the thing. They have access to the song. So having ownership of the content and a content delivery system seems to be pretty important. And Apple, I think, does it very, very well. And it's not just tunes. It's uh, whatever else you want. When they went from the iPod to the iTouch to the iPad to the iPhone, they kept that content delivery system mentality. And I think as users, short story, I buy my wife a Kindle. And I say, honey, here's this Kindle. Well, we're going to the airport. And she says, well, what do I do with it? I said, well, you download a book to it. Well, what book would I get? I don't know. Go get a book. Well, you know what? The door's closing on the plane. And she says, I don't think I can get this book in time. And I don't know. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Within one minute, she selected and downloaded a book. She closed the door. So I'm a tech weenie. I said, honey, how do you think that book got in there? You think it was CDMA, WCDMA, LTE, HSDPA, HSUPA? She said, Jim, shut up. I got a book. I want to read my book. I don't care how the book got in here. I think that's, you know, we technical people can get lost in the alphabet soup of acronyms and forget that users really just want stuff. And, and they don't really care how the stuff gets there. But it should be cost effective. So I did the commercial for Apple because they do content delivery. But I will also say for the Android people, if you look at Google apps like Google Earth, Google Map, Google Translate, Google Anything, Google Anything runs better on an Android device, in my opinion, than it does on anything else. It interops extremely well. Things transfer back and forth seamlessly. You don't know how the hooks work, but they do. So I think the, the Google people have carved out you know, their own special space which is different. And I don't think that's going to go away. BlackBerry, we all know, is the master of email and secure things. Um, 
And Windows Phone, I think, will have its own place in, 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 in the world. And it'll have things like the interface between Outlook, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. All those things that are Windows things are probably going to interop better than they do on anybody else's device. So at least for the near foreseeable future, I think there's a demand for different operating systems to serve different people's different needs. And then the ecosystem, you know, it all doesn't work without developers and software tools and carrier-friendly services. So there's, there are layers of what you need to enable a smartphone. OK, so now it's your time. Now we move away from the sales pitch of there is a need and what is it that we really need from you guys. Lithography has been at the heart of it for a long time, and it continues to be the heart of, at the heart of it. I think for a long time we had this thing called Denard scaling or industry scaling that said, you know, we can move forward in technology. And then somewhere around liquid immersion, lithography kind of got stuck for a little while. And, and now it seems to be stuck again, trying to figure out whether it's EUV or E-beam or whatever. But I think the key is I need you, and I know you will, to continue to provide the way to print images, very, very small images on not too expensive wafers. So, but there's other things beside that. You know, all, all the material scientists are going to be gamefully employed, too. You know, there's a slide in there that looks like the periodic table of the elements, and I think uh, semiconductor guys stay up at night and throw darts at it and figure out that we've got to find a use for plutonium bromide. I mean, it glows in the dark. It's self-powered. It's got to be really cool. Actually, it's not. It's pretty hot. But, you know, over the years, we have made things really complex, and that center chart shows how many elements are now in a thing. I, it's embarrassing to me, but when I started in 1973, I don't think there were too many elements. I know there were only five masks. I know there was only one transistor type. The world has gotten complicated. So the material guys will do their thing, but lithography, if I understand it right, generally hangs around 50% of the total cost of wafers or fabs or other things. And most people are projecting that that number isn't going down in the foreseeable future, but probably up. So you guys have the biggest impact on my life. If you screw up 50% by not a very big number, it becomes a very big number. And I don't want to minimize FinFETs because that's a huge thing, right? We're about ready to leave the 2D world and go into the 3D world. And that is not just a minor thing. It's a major thing. So, but this is a lithography conference, not a, a FinFET conference. But it, it is isn't very, very important to us. And then some of the economic challenges is just the cost of things. You know, like a fab these days costs $6 billion. I mean, that's not chump change. And that's for like one phase, 30,000 wafers a month. So people are investing big time. And I, and I couldn't not have a slide on EUV, because I think EUV is like a trip to Disneyland. It is the most amazing concept that you know, people have come up with, I think. You know, to drop a tin particle in a vacuum, irradiate it with an intense laser, totally vaporize the whatever out of it, and generate a handful of 13 and a half nanometer photons that every time they bounce around, three out of every 10 get absorbed. And to try and collect enough of those and bounce them off a bunch of lenses and focus them someplace, wow, somebody really stayed up late at night for that. And the bad part is, my continued existence for the next few years in order to raise the grandson is really dependent upon that. You know, it's funny, we're at 28 nanometers and we know how to get to, to 20 nanometers and we think we know how to get to 14 nanometers and Intel's already told us they know how to get to 10, probably to 6. So I told my boss, I said, you know what, dude, I think I'm sticking around till 10. 10 looks like a really dicey proposition. I think at 10 it's time for me to check out. He said, Jim, I'm not going to be here. I said, that's OK. I trained your boss. I trained you. I'll train the next guy, too. So also, old guys really have a, a, a secure position in life, I think. Maybe that's arrogance, and I should be careful about it. Things are undoubtedly getting more expensive. So I think if you look at the bottom of this slide, which I'll find the words for, maybe. It says the fab costs lots of money. I mean, this is one that shows a 22 nanometer fab clocking in at you know, 6 billion and change. Process development costs lots of money. And chip design costs lots of money. That's an interesting concept. Chip design costs lots of money. I mean, we, our uh, board of directors every year says, you know, your founders are making an awful lot of money, Jim. Why don't we just buy a fab? 
And it's like, no, no, no fabs, please, no fabs. We're a fabless company. Well, we were until we got in the Mirasol display business and accidentally built a fab, but no fabs, please. So, but process development, and I say, hey, so what if you bought a fab? You'd have to go develop thin fats. You know, that's not a cheap date. I mean, that's gonna take a lot of money, and then it's gonna get really hard, and why do you wanna do that? But it's also true that chip design is, is getting very, very costly. So there, I think, going forward, will be less really, really large, fabless companies, and I think it will cost lots of money, and we'll have to amortize it over a huge number of devices. But, you know, that's something we've done in the past, so I, I think we can continue to do that in the future. This is the most important curve to me in here. We've been on a 29% cost reduction curve for a long, long time, and the big question is, are we going to be on it again? If the next node doesn't cost less than the last node, we got a problem, because I don't think the demand will be there. So being the optimist that I am, it's very, very important that we figure out how to do that, which is my blatant, overt, subliminal sales pitch to you, which is you got to do it, and we got to do it inexpensively. So what do we need from you? Well, we need, we need to turn the slide, because we can't read them. And it's so funny because, I, well, two things I know we need is early predictors, which is very, very important. So what are early predictors? We need to make a decision now about the next generation of devices that we're going to build. And to do that, there's probably an impact in the litho tools that come out and how that affects things like design rules, uh, restricted design rules and constraints and computational lithography. So there's a choice out there between immersion, EUV, and multi-E-beam. And, and if I just pick one and look at the layer of problems underneath it, it's EUV source power, which is unbelievable. Zero defect masks and resist capability. So not small challenges just to make EUV work. But we need to know that that's going to work now in order to start designing stuff for it a few years down the road. And that's causing us a little bit of heartburn. So I think that's where the collaboration pitch will come in. I think we need to work closer with you. And then, of course, in the end, we need production-ready technology that has you know, a reasonable cost of ownership and high throughput. Let's see. Oh, of course, effective solutions is really important. So in summary, what I told you was there's a huge opportunity out there. There's a continued need for the kinds of things that you do. And collaboration is the key to, to us working together. And there's my overt subliminal message in the back. And oh, by the way, please make it cost half of what it cost the last time or get really, really close. And with that, I will thank you. I left eight minutes because I think there's questions, right? <laughs>